My husband, Simon, and I have three daughters, Gracie, Jess, and Izzy. And today, I want to introduce you to Izzy. She is 11, and as you can see, she is an absolute character. Now, the rule in our house is when the girls get home from school, they have to make their lunches before they can do anything else ready for the next day. So they're not allowed screens until they've made their lunch boxes. Now, Gracie and Jess are pretty good at getting on with it and um, sorting themselves out. But often with Izzy, I'll, I'll come in to see how she's getting on and she's in the garden looking for caterpillars. And I'll say, Izzy, have you finished making your lunch? And she'll say, oh, no, sorry. Um, so back into the kitchen, she'll carry on making her lunch. Maybe I'll make a cup of tea and go and sit down. I turn around and she's gone again. And this time she's in the bathroom practicing putting high ponytails in her hair. Or well, whatever it is, but you get the picture. The, if you came in part way through her making her lunch for the next day, I think you'd find it very difficult to guess what she was meant to be doing. And it made me wonder, if you could watch my life like a movie, that's a scary thought, isn't it? Even if you could watch the last week of my life on this screen right now, and you had to guess, what is the thing that Jenny has been tasked to do? I wonder what you would guess. And I asked the same question about you. If we could play your life on this screen right now, and we had to guess, based on what we had seen, what is the mission you have been given? I wonder what we would say. The truth is, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been given a mission. And surely, if we're engaging well with the mission we've been given, our lives should bear the evidence, right? Well, I just want to read us the mission just to remind us what it is. It's found in um, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, and it says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Imagine being in the disciples' shoes. It's like the most significant handover meeting ever, right? Jesus says, OK, guys, your training is complete. Now go. He commissioned them. And this is what they had been watching him do. They'd been walking with him, learning from him. And now it was down to them. He gave them a clear mission. And as soon as a person becomes a disciple or a follower of Jesus, yet they join the mission. If you are a Christian today, this is your mission. Now, I know some of you watching this today would not call yourselves a Christian or a follower of Jesus. And I'm so glad you're here. I love that you are listening to these messages, exploring who Jesus is. But the reason I'm talking about this today is I really believe that what the Bible says about Jesus is true. I believe that God created you and I, that he loves you beyond what you could ever comprehend. But we as people, as humankind, have rejected him. We think that we know the best way to live our lives. We want to be in charge and in control. And the Bible calls that sin. But God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die as a punishment for the sin of every person who has ever and will ever live. So that if you believe in him and accept that, that you're forgiven and adopted into God's family. You see, sin separates us from God, but believing in Jesus unites us with God forever. And that's why this series, this message today is important. Even if you're skeptical about Jesus, just imagine if this really is true, isn't that the kind of news that everyone should have the opportunity to hear and to respond to? And so that's why we're taking these three weeks to talk about the mission, because it matters. So let's just think back to the mission that we've been given that I just read. This section in Matthew is called the Great Commission. Now, a commission is a formal sending. If you commission someone, you formally send them to do something. And I imagine in this moment, Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 
You know, it always says to him, your mission, should you choose to accept it? But I think for so many of us, we've misunderstood. It clearly is a commission, but I think if we're honest, our lives demonstrate that we've interpreted it as permission. We treat the great commission like the great permission. You can go and make disciples of all nations if you want, or if it fits in with the busyness of your life, or if you have the gift of evangelism, or in the moments when you're all inspired because you've just listened to a message on outreach, or you've read a great book. But the truth is, this is what we have been commissioned to do. And God, in his graciousness, is reminding us again, this is your mission, should you choose to accept it. So where do we start? Well, just like the disciples who walked and talked with Jesus actually followed him, i.e. they copied what he did. Isn't that what we're also meant to do as followers of Jesus? The word Christian comes from the Greek word Christianos, which means follower of Jesus. It's not admirers of Jesus. It's not even believers in Jesus, but followers of him. People whose goal is to become like him. Now, the reason I say all of that is because it's like sometimes we separate this mission that we've just been talking about from the rest of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We treat the mission to reach people, outreach, as we often call it, like this optional extra to our following of Jesus. But if we actually live to become like Jesus by copying what he did, outreach will be an integral part of our lives. I challenge you to take a chapter of one of the Gospels and try and copy what Jesus did. I'm certain it would include talking to people about God about his kingdom. It would include praying for people. It would include stopping to show kindness to people because Jesus loved people and he acted in line with that at all times, whoever they were. And so if we live to become like Jesus, outreach will be natural and integral to our lives. I want us each to consider today what it would take for the movie of my life, for the movie of your life, to show that I'm actually on this mission that Jesus has given us. So let's look at how Jesus did it. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. And so I'm going to read that now. It says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now we're going to be looking at these verses over the next three weeks. And today we're really going to focus in on verse 35. And verse 35 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues. When dinner's ready in our house, often the conversation will go something like this. Um, I'll say to one of the girls, can you please go and tell dad that dinner's ready? And whichever child it happens to be will react or will respond with, dad! I wonder if any of you recognize that scenario. I wonder though, to what extent we can all be a bit like that with our mission, outreach, telling people about Jesus. We go to church on a Sunday and we play our part in having great services. And if we're really trying to reach people, we make sure our services are welcoming for people who are new to church or exploring faith. We, um, we explain things, we explain words, we explain concepts. We try and make people feel at home as possible. We give people an idea of the next steps we'd love them to take. We make people feel welcome because we genuinely want any person, whatever their beliefs, to experience our church as a safe place to belong and to explore who Jesus is. We sing our hearts out. We preach about Jesus. Then we go to life groups each week and we sit with other Jesus followers and we talk about Jesus and we talk about the Bible and we encourage each other. 
And all of those things are really important, by the way. I'm not saying that we should stop doing any one of them. But if the only times we're sharing stories of faith and talking about Jesus are when we're with other Christians, it struck me that it's a bit like one of my daughters yelling from her seat in the lounge. If dad's close enough to hear, then he'll get the message. But she's not really too bothered about whether he actually hears. You know, she's delivered the message and she feels like her responsibility has been discharged. You know, this verse today tells us that Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues. He didn't expect people to come to him. He went to them. And I did a bit of reading in preparation about the first century synagogues and they were likely used like Jewish community centers. So Jesus was making sure that he spent time in the places and spaces that people who did not yet believe in him were. In fact, before Jesus had even started his ministry, hadn't he already gone to where people are in the most profound way? Jesus, the son of God, stepped out of heaven. He took on flesh. He became a baby, a human, in order to come to where we are. You know, Jesus has demonstrated this to the fullest extent. And that's the title of today's message, that we're to go where people are, because that's what Jesus did. So are you spending time near people who don't yet believe in him? Are you investing in friendships with people who are not yet followers of Jesus? You know, I've, I must admit, I find this challenging being a pastor. Um, most of the people I know are Christians, and so I have to get a little bit creative. I've spent the last three years serving on my school board as a way of getting to know people who are not in the church. I've coached netball for my girls at school, I'm intentional about talking to people in the playground at school pickup. Kevin Harney, who wrote um, the organic outreach books, he once gave a great tip that I've hung on to. He suggested looking through your calendar in the morning and working out when you're going to see people who don't know Jesus during the day. And to, as you plan your day in the morning to pray for God appointments, to pray for opportunities to get to know someone or to bless someone or maybe to get to share your faith with someone. But this isn't only for us as individuals to consider, but also for, for our church, right? Do we expect people to come to us or do we go to where people are? And many of you will know we launched East over four years ago now to be missional. It was 100% our heart to have a location of the street in the eastern suburbs to be where people are. And yet we spent the first two years gathering on Sundays, expecting people to come to us. And then after a couple of years, an opportunity came up for us to run a dinner from the community centre. It was free food and a friendly, safe space to meet people, to make friends and to eat together. We call it community dinner. As a church, we finally went to where people are, or some people at least, to meet a need that we knew for sure was a real need. And our desire is that this would lead to other opportunities to meet real needs and take the community of the church to where people are. This is a photo of community dinner pre-COVID. The crowd that come every Wednesday now are a smaller crowd and the team is a smaller team, but we keep showing up so that the people of our community can experience for themselves what it's like to be embraced and loved and cared for by the church. Jesus went where people were. So I wonder today in what new ways can you go to where people are? I want to give us somewhere practical to start today. I've been reading a book called Surprise the World by Michael Frost. Um, I'd encourage you, write that title down, look it up. It's only a short book. It won't take you long to read. It's a book about living as highly missional people. But whether you read it or not, there's a couple of ideas in there that would be a great place to start that are really um, relevant to what we're talking about today. He uses an acrostic in the book 
that is bells. So every letter of bells stands for something different. But the first two are particularly relevant to what we're talking about. So I'm just going to talk to us about the first two of those today. The first one in bells is B for bless. And so the instruction is bless three people this week, at least one of whom is not yet a Christian. You know, we're called to bless just for the sake of being a blessing, right? Loving others, um, putting them before ourselves. This is not an ulterior motive. Um, we're not only blessing someone so that we can share our faith with them, so that we can tell them about Jesus. The key to blessing someone is that the recipient feels blessed, right? <laughs> if the recipient doesn't feel blessed, it's not a blessing. So that's something to bear in mind. But it could be um, words of affirmation. It could be an act of kindness. It could be a gift. But what would it take to bless three people this week, one of whom is not a Christian? So that's B, bless. The second one um, is E, eat. Eat with three people this week, at least one of whom is not a Christian. There's a great quote in the book um, it says, the table is the great equaliser in relationships. When we eat together, we discover the inherent humanity of all people. We share stories and hopes and fears and disappointments. People open up to each other. And we ourselves can open up and share the same things, including our faith in Jesus. I don't know if this has been your experience, but it's been ours. Gathering around food is a powerful way to develop relationship. And so the challenge here is to eat with three people this week, at least one of whom is not a Christian. And that doesn't mean invite three different people around for a fancy three course meal. It could just be a coffee and a snack in a cafe. But um, it's challenging, isn't it, to think about doing these things. You know, as I've been preparing this message, I've found myself imagining how much more the movie of my life would look if I'm actually taking the mission, would, sorry, would look like I'm actually taking the mission seriously if I just did these two things that I've just talked about. If I blessed three people a week and I ate with three people a week. And I, so I want to challenge you today to do this for the next month and see what happens. What might God do if we took this on board? Now, if you're anything like me, the first thought that you would have just thought is, whoa, Jenny, I'm far too busy to do that. I can relate. What I realise, though, is that is the problem, isn't it? Like we talked about at the start, we've misinterpreted this commission, this mission we've been given as permission. And we think it's OK to prioritise other things over the mission that God has given us. But I don't think it is OK. If this is the mission that we're on, isn't this the most important thing that we could be doing? So instead of walking away from this message saying, I'm too busy, how about we go away and consider what would it take for me to actually do this? Why not plan it right now? Who are the three people you'll bless this week? At least one of them, someone who isn't yet a Christian. Who are the three people you'll eat with this week? even if it's just a coffee and a snack, at least one of them who isn't yet a Christian. And if you're watching this today and you're not a Christian, I wonder if there's a Christian that you know that you could um, reach out to this week and spend some time talking to them, asking them why they believe what they believe. If Jesus went where people who didn't yet know him were, we need to go where people are. This is the mission after all. Let me pray for us. Father, we want to just start by saying sorry if we have not taken the mission that you've given to us seriously. We're so grateful for Jesus. We're so grateful for what you did for us. And we, we want to join in on this mission that you've called us to. Lord, I pray for every one of us today that um, you would challenge and inspire and do something in our hearts, God, that would mean we couldn't walk away from here the same. Lord, I pray for every one of us 
that the, the movie of our life would look a little bit more like the mission that you've called us to this week. So we commit ourselves to you. We love you, Lord. We genuinely believe this is the best news anyone could ever know. And so we commit ourselves now to sharing that with the people in our lives. We love you, Lord. Fill us, be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.